It was the 70s and the heyday of Avalon Hill had begun. A foundation had been built and a course had been set that would put the company on a path to growth, but would contain within it the seeds of its own downfall. In part three of our series on the history of Avalon Hill, we move into the mid-game here on Legendary Tactics. It was a tremendous time of creativity and productivity in gaming, and Avalon Hill provided games that were unique, serious adult and history-based games that stood in contrast to the lightweight family and party games that were being released by companies like Milton Bradley and Parker Brothers. One of the obvious signs of a growing company, hobby, and industry is the sheer number of releases through the 70s and early 80s. For this reason, here we will only be able to touch on most of these titles very briefly, especially as many of them didn't remain in print for very long. But for the sake of completeness, unlike batteries, every game is included. 1971 is considered to be another instance of rebirth for Avalon Hill. It had nothing to do with the games that were released, but instead within the company itself. Since its near bankruptcy of 1963, Avalon Hill had been operating partly under Monarch Office Services and also under J.E. Smith Co. While these companies had saved Avalon Hill at the time, the reality was that both owners had different ideas on how the company should operate. On November 30th, Monarch Services acquired full ownership of Avalon Hill and began a much more aggressive publishing strategy in a plan to dominate the war game industry. Monarch continued to print the games, and the new president, A. Eric Dott, started his own box company that would package and assemble the games. Now that all the production was under the management of one central entity, and with Tom Shaw being promoted to executive vice president, things could really ramp up. This would take time though, and 1971 was not a year that signaled the immense level of production that was to come. However, there were quality games released that year. The first of these was Luftwaffe, the game of aerial combat over Germany 1943-45. Luftwaffe evolved from an earlier game by Poltroon Press, later SPI, called 12 O'Clock High. Luzaki came across a highly detailed book about the air war over Germany, and that became the inspiration for the large amount of research that went into the game. Luftwaffe focuses on the Allied air raids over Germany in the late war, and from a strategic perspective. One player takes the American side, trying to bomb historically important targets within Germany, and the other player takes the German side, trying to prevent them from doing so. While it was widely acknowledged as being quite fun, the setup can take a while, as does the planning, especially for the American player as their force pool increases in size. Also, the abstract combat results table is highly variable, which led to some criticism. Even though the table reflects casualties taken over the course of a three-month period, it could be anywhere from very few to an almost crippling number. It was a good seller for the company, perhaps because of the title and box cover. Also notable was its use of round counters instead of the usual square ones, which were so prevalent at the time. Decision Games did an update of this game in 2007, of the same name. Designer Joseph Miranda added a few rules, tweaked the order of battle, and offered some more options in deployment and production. And they used square counters this time around. The other game released that year was Origins of World War II. This was the second James Dunnigan design under contract for Avalon Hill, but where the royalties were paid directly to Dunnigan's board game company, SPI. The game deals with the diplomatic maneuvering that occurred before the outset of World War II, and attempts to combine elements of the game diplomacy with a war game that added some chance elements. Play balance is certainly an issue though. The American player allegedly has the toughest time of it, with most wins going to Germany and the USSR. It was not a bestseller, but it did well in the school supply market, as it was a great classroom game. It was even play-tested by students at the Benjamin Franklin High School, now the Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics, in East Harlem in New York. In 1972, the management at Avalon Hill realized that it could not depend entirely on designers outside of the company for its success. Allegedly at Jim Dunnigan's recommendation, another name integral to Avalon Hill, Don Greenwood, was hired, initially to take over duties at the General Magazine. And apparently at Greenwood's recommendation, Randall Reed came aboard as Avalon Hill's first ever full-time designer. Unbelievably, the designers that had carried them this far, like Tom Shaw and Lindsley Schutz, 
had either been part-time or had been saddled with other responsibilities at the company like marketing and mail order shipping. This year produced another couple of classics. The Game of France 1940 is another Jim Dunnigan design that was first published in Strategy and Tactics magazine and then sold to Avalon Hill with some minor changes, with no input from Avalon Hill. It's a game that was considered to be a great simulation of the invasion of France by Germany in the early days of World War II, in that it highlights why the French army collapsed so quickly against the German Blitzkrieg. But at the same time, it is infamous for play balance issues, as it was incredibly difficult for the French to win, which arguably made it a bad, lopsided game. The extra ahistorical scenarios did address this issue somewhat. It has its fans, but generally it fell out of favor as the years went on. Outdoor Survival was the other game that came out that year. Jim Dunnigan apparently made a comment that he could make a successful game out of any idea, and Tom Shaw said something along the lines of, well, if you think you're so good, why don't you make a game about getting lost in the woods? So, Dunnigan did. His initial design was judged to be too complicated for the marketplace at the time, so Shaw edited it down to something simpler, and Greenwood rewrote it as his first development job. Outdoor survival pits players against the elements, from being literally lost in the woods to conducting search and rescue missions. While the game itself is universally judged to be mediocre at best, it ended up being a bestseller for the company. It has a nice cover and strong title, and had broad distribution, sometimes appearing in camping supply stores and other venues that didn't typically stock board games. And a large amount of unexpected sales came from players in the fledgling role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons, who would use the map board for their campaigns. It was so useful that the game was even listed on the equipment list in Volume 1 of the original 1974 edition of D&D. 1973 boasted the first Avalon Hill in-house wargame design since the days of Charles Roberts. Richtofen's War was that design, and Randall Reed was the designer. Richtofen's War allows players to hop into one of over 60 iconic biplanes and triplanes of World War I, and attempt to outmaneuver other players in a classic dogfight. While the dogfight was the main play mode, seven scenarios are included like balloon busting, trench strafing, and photo reconnaissance. It borrowed a lot of inspiration from games like Flying Circus and Fight in the Skies, but was viewed as a great improvement over those games. That said, it has not aged particularly well as the I go, you go movement system is not very realistic for air combat. Essentially, it allows players to trade places in riding each other's tails, waiting for a lucky die roll that causes critical damage. The Variant Maneuvers cards added a lot more excitement and realism to the game, although initially Avalon Hill sold them separately by mail. Business Strategy was also released that year, and was essentially a remake of their earlier game, Management, adding some sophistication and the now famous bookcase game box. Players compete for resources to produce their products, and then compete in the marketplace to sell those products. Although it was regarded as an excellent game, it didn't actually sell that well. 1974 was the year when Avalon Hill's production really began to increase. The so-called dynamic duo of Greenwood and Reed combined to publish a total of eight war games that year. Though three of these were remakes and updates of previous games, namely Anzio, Chancellorsville, and Jutland, the others that were released became classics. In the midst of this, in one of the world's great what-if moments, an amateur game designer pitched a game to Avalon Hill. The concept was a new one. It was fantasy-themed, and each player took on a character role, acting out an adventure with the guidance and oversight of another player that went by the title of Dungeon Master. Avalon Hill turned it down, claiming that they just didn't understand it, and that they considered it too open-ended for their liking. That designer was Gary Gygax, and that game was Dungeons & Dragons. Gygax went on to create his own company, TSR, and produce it himself. The rest of that story, as they say, is history. Fortunately, Avalon Hill went on to have a great year regardless. 1776 is one of the games that came out that year. Designed by Randall Reed, it was intended to take advantage of the excitement of the upcoming American Bicentennial. Reed reworked Shaw's Matrix combat results table used in Kriegspiel to make it more viable and enjoyable to use, and moved it to an historical setting, namely the American Revolutionary War. This game is a two-player game set in the era of the American Revolution. 
One player is the British, and the other player takes control of the American Revolutionary Forces. There's a basic and advanced game for the main event it depicts, with some other shorter scenarios for people who don't have that much time. It is a relatively complicated and detailed game with a tactical focus. Interestingly, the Redcoats were seen as more likely to win. It sold quite well at the time, although apparently after the big US bicentennial event, sales dropped off rather drastically. The award-winning Rise and Decline of the Third Reich is a perennial favorite among Avalon Hill fans. It was designed by Don Greenwood and John Prados, and Larry Butcher helped to revise it. This is what they call a grand strategy war game, and it covers the entire European theater in World War II over multiple years, from 1939 to 1946. Everything is here. Politics, economics, and the grand scale war that took place on land, in the sea, and in the air. It is an opportunity to rewrite history on a huge canvas. As if a bigger game was needed, Advanced Third Reich was released in 1992, and it received a sister game that covered the Pacific Theatre in 1995. The rulebook had been thrown together in a hurry and had a lot of ambiguities, but this was greatly improved with the 1980 revision. It went on to be one of the company's all-time bestsellers. With basketball strategy, Greenwood looked to take the core mechanic of Shaw's famous matrix into the sport of basketball and added die rolls and an area movement system. Players take on coaching duties for identical and generic teams, directing the offense and defense as they see fit. But ultimately, it is less of a simulation and more of a strategy game, so one's mileage with the game depends a lot on their expectations of it. Sales-wise, it only partially succeeded and unfortunately had a longer playing time than the other Avalon Hill sports strategy games, where a full four-quarter game would take up to two hours. Alexander the Great was a real group effort, with one of the co-design credits going to Gary Gygax, who had privately published it in 1971 with Guidon Games. After Guidon went out of business, Avalon Hill acquired the game and Gygax revised it with Don Greenwood with Reed making the map board, and Richard Hamblin doing some rules revisions in 1975 and 1976 to clarify missile fire. This game deals with Alexander's victory over Darius of Persia at Gaugamela, which resulted in the Macedonian Empire and the beginnings of the Hellenistic dynasties. It features phalanxes, cavalry charges, javelins, and even elephants going berserk. The highlight of the game is the morale system, where the troops fight less effectively if the battle isn't going their way. Panzer Leader by Dave Clark and Nick Smith moves the Panzerblitz system to the Western Front, and the results were huge in terms of gamer satisfaction and sales, where it eclipsed the 100,000 sales mark. The rules were cleaned up a bit from its predecessor to avoid something called Panzerbusch Syndrome, where units could remain concealed even though they had moved into and fired from cover in full sight of the enemy, and added opportunity fire to avoid units moving from cover to cover without the enemy having a chance to retaliate. There were additional mechanics such as air attacks and engineers as well. It did change the scale of the original game, which meant that the pieces did not interchange very smoothly. Reed did some revisions of the scenario cards the following year. In an interesting footnote to 1974, the company did take a, quote, flyer on an offbeat project, unquote, namely to produce a couple of do-it-yourself kits entitled Black Magic and Witchcraft Ritual. Included were some male and female standees, and it seems to be a how-to manual with some role-playing elements involved. Both were dismal failures, unsurprisingly. Well, at least they had the sense to expand the general to 36 pages that year. It is said that 1975 was the year that the wargaming hobby began to become an industry. Up to this point, small game companies came and went with little contact and interaction with each other, and sometimes, even in print, they were openly critical of their competitors. But this changed with the birth of Origins, the first national gaming convention that was launched by Avalon Hill. It brought people from all the different board game companies into a single venue where friendships and business contacts were made, often for the first time. Also that year, at the suggestion of Canadian game store owner John Mansfield, the Charles S. Roberts Awards were born, even though they would not be officially called that until 1988 when Roberts allowed his name to be officially used. 
Up until that time, they were known as the Origins Awards and colloquially as Charlie's. These were awards that were based on votes submitted by fans with no commercial sponsorship, and they were created to celebrate the best games in the hobby and to recognize them as such. Another key addition was made to the design staff that year in the person of Mick Yule, who had become a big contributor to the hobby. And one of these early contributions is a true classic, Wooden Ships and Iron Men. This was originally a game produced by Battleline Games, with Craig Taylor being the original designer. Taylor and Yule clarified the rules after Avalon Hill bought the rights to it and added an advanced game which lessened the abstraction of the gun factors and cut the scale in half. As its name suggests, this game puts players back in the age of sail when ships were wooden and men were iron, I guess? There are 27 individual scenarios that recreate various classic naval battles from 1776 to 1815, including the Battle of Trafalgar and of the Nile, and if that isn't enough, players can also design their own. Broadsides, grappling, boarding, and melee are all covered, among other things. It was one of the company's most popular games. In two separate surveys in 1976, one by rival company SPI and the other by Avalon Hill itself, Wooden Ships and Iron Men was voted the most popular Avalon Hill board game. This led to it getting two early video game adaptations in 1987 for the Commodore 64 and 1996 for the PC. Caesar's Legions was a game by Lauren Wiseman that had been originally published by Game Designers Workshop with the name Eagles, and which consisted only of what ended up as being the fourth scenario in the Avalon Hill edition. Greenwood added more scenarios and adopted the Matrix-style combat results table which greatly improved the original design. The second printing in 1976 only added some minor rule additions. The game covers approximately 100 years of conflict between the Romans and the German tribes, and is seen to be a solid war game that gives players a sense of history and of the strategy and tactics of the time, without too much rules overhead. KP Games acquired the rights to this one in 1994, and they expanded the game even further, taking the number of scenarios from 5 to 32. Tobruk Tank Battles in North Africa 1942 was designed by Harold Hawk, with Reed putting together the second edition the same year, correcting some rules and charts. Tobruk is set in North Africa with the Axis powers facing the British and Commonwealth troops near the fortress of the same name. It is a game on an extremely small scale. Infantry are grouped into squads with casualties tracked individually, and tank and other vehicle counters represent individual vehicles. There's a tremendous amount of detail packed into 19 scenarios, including rules for morale, overruns, armor penetration, smoke, Stuka aircraft, forward observers, artillery, grenades, close assaults, and many, many more. The game is considered to be an outstanding tactical simulation, especially as a study of weaponry, but is often criticized for having overwhelmingly intricate mechanics and a lot of die rolling, not to mention the absolutely featureless map board, which is only given some character through counters representing bunkers and minefields and such. The first edition was only initially available at the second Origins Gaming Conference, and through limited sales by mail. It wasn't promoted well by Avalon Hill, and so it didn't sell well. Eventually, Avalon Hill sold the rights to the game back to Hawk in 1987. It was eventually reworked into Advanced Tobruk by a critical hit in 2002, which was well received. In today's economic times, it seems strange that there actually is a game about financial challenges called Beat Inflation Strategy. It was put together by Alan and Ken Strand, as well as Tom Shaw. Basically, players buy and sell real and paper assets to try and convert an initial $100,000 loan into $1 million. The design itself is seen as mediocre at best. It was a game that was to tie in with a book release that never met sales expectations. 1976 was an amazing year for the company. They were on top of the world on the edge of innovation and defining the state of the art. The second Origins convention happened in Baltimore, which was a huge success. And Richard Hamblin joined the design staff in the summertime. There were six games released that year, all of them instant classics. The first of these, the award-winning Kingmaker, was originally designed by Andrew McNeil and published in the UK by Philmar Limited. 
It has a novel game system that resulted in it being the first imported game to capture the American hobby by storm. Mick Yule added an advanced game, upgraded the components and clarified the rules so players didn't need to know as much about England to play. However, Avalon Hill did make a mistake in that it reduced the size of the original playing board, which would be remedied in the second edition, along with a timing mechanism to reduce the excessive playtime of the game. Kingmaker is a game for 2-6 players that is set at the time of the War of the Roses. Each player uses whatever Machiavellian strategies they can to promote one of their nobles to be the King of England, including all of the negotiations, backstabbing and violence that you might expect. The components were roundly praised, and the gameplay was enjoyed by many, though a lot of games finished in a stalemate where two or three factions would build up strong, impregnable positions with none strong enough to win. Kingmaker received its own video game in 1994, which allowed play against up to five AI opponents, and was very faithful to the original game. Alan Callamer had created a game back in 1954, which had been published in 1959, and when Avalon Hill purchased it outright, it was being produced by Games Research Incorporated, a board game company run on a part-time basis with this single game on its roster. And this single game was Diplomacy. The game itself required little improvement at the time of its acquisition. Avalon Hill's contribution in the original edition was simply to repackage it and enlarge the board. The game starts in pre-World War I Europe, where seven countries vie for position and control of strategic locations called supply centers. There are no dice. Every move in conflict is resolved by an abstract and arguably rudimentary system. But the nuance of the game lies in the negotiations that take place between moves. There are no rules in this phase, and players are encouraged to negotiate, plead, convince, lie, cajole, make alliances, and backstab their opponents, with nothing being binding in any way. It is for this aspect of the game that diplomacy has a reputation for ending many friendships over the years. By the time of its acquisition, diplomacy had become almost a separate segment of the hobby, because it was a very different game from all the other available games at the time. It was the first game to have fanzines, in fact, there were eight of them already by 1965, and it counted among its many fans people of such stature as John F. Kennedy Jr., Walter Cronkite, and Henry Kissinger. It was the first commercial game to be played by mail. People had been playing chess by mail before then, but chess has obviously been in the public domain for many centuries by this point. Play by Mail evolved to become Play by Email in the late 80s, and now Diplomacy thrives to this day, mainly online through interfaces like Backstabber and Duplicity. This Play by Mail was especially competitive, and there were instances of extreme behavior including, but not limited to, bribery, blackmail, and even forging mail from other players or the game master, as well as mail interference. For example, altering a letter to ensure a missed deadline was marked in time by a forged postmark. In one famous play-by-mail incident, two players were planning their moves against another player playing Britain. In their desperation to avoid postal delays, a telegram was sent by one to the other that simply read, Attack on Liverpool confirmed. This resulted in a visit from police, where the players had to explain that they were not, in fact, spies or terrorists, but that this was just a game. Larry Harris, the designer famous for creating Axis and Allies, commented, I am convinced that Alan Callamer's masterpiece should be part of every high school curriculum. Don't tell the kids, but it teaches history, geography, the art of political negotiation, and something else, some healthy critical skepticism. By the time you get into high school, you have a pretty good idea that not everyone always tells the truth. But a good game of diplomacy helps you to understand how skillful some people can be at fooling you. The game has been notoriously difficult to translate into a digital version with artificially intelligent opponents. Attempts were made in 1984, 1999, and 2005, but with little to no success. War at Sea is another classic that was designed originally on a private label by John Edwards. Edwards was the exclusive importer of Avalon Hill Games in Australia, and his company, Jedco Games, also occasionally published games of his own design. Avalon Hill staff spent some time to redevelop and improve the games, and then released them to an enthusiastic audience, who were happy to have games that were more accessible and playable, even if they were less than historical. 
War at Sea was one of those gateway games, as it was playable in about an hour. It used area movement to loosely recreate the Battle of the Atlantic and the naval warfare in the Mediterranean in World War II. Points were scored for control of the different sea areas and for successfully escorting convoys to their destinations. While it is not representative of the actual events, it was one of the first games to look at naval warfare on this sort of scale, and it was widely agreed to be a fun game. Later editions tweaked the rules a little bit and altered the play balance by having the American ships enter with increasingly lower die rolls. L2 Design Group republished this game in 2007, and it is still played in competitive tournaments to this day. The Russian Campaign was another game by Edwards, and one that was so warmly welcomed by the community that it pushed the old stalwart Stalingrad off the retail shelves. Like Stalingrad, however, the sales were never outstanding. The game used a double impulse movement system to allow for blitzkrieg type movement and mass encirclements, which was a great improvement over what had been before. There were Russian workers, partisans, Stuka units to represent air power, and of course rail movement and rules dealing with the famous Russian weather. Richard Hamblin did some substantial upgrades in 1978 which were also well received. Caesar Alessia had been originally released as an amateur game, self-published by Robert Bradley, its designer, back in 1970. Avalon Hill redesigned the core idea, and it became immensely popular among both the critics and fans of Ancients games. Unfortunately, the sales numbers never reflected the acclaim. The game itself has an amazing setting. In 51 BC, there were two parallel lines of fortifications surrounding the town of Alessia. Julius Caesar and ten Roman legions man the first line of defense, where they have been besieging 80,000 Gauls inside the city for the last month. But outside the walls a Gallic relief force of a quarter million has just arrived, and now the Romans are outnumbered six to one. In its original iteration, it apparently had over a thousand counters and a map board more than four feet long. Don Greenwood wisely revised the rules, reduced the number of counters to 400, and made the map smaller, and the game is all the better for it. Randall Reed was also productive in creating Starship Troopers, which was based on a book by Robert Heinlein, and came along at the perfect time to take advantage of the science fiction boom that succeeded the first Star Wars movie. It became a bestseller in 1977, possibly because the titles were similar. The game is set in the 22nd century where human troopers fitted out with jetpacks and advanced weaponry go up first against an alien race called the Skinnies and then against the Arachnids, only known as the Bugs. The only problem is that the Bugs happen to live underground. The humans have to ferret them out and reveal their hidden tunnel network with various tools like listening devices and even people with ESP. There were some balance and replayability problems, but there were also some great innovations introduced, including the bugs setting up on a notepad replica of the map board. It is considered to be a good tactical translation of the action in the book. Twenty years later, in 1997, Avalon Hill would release a redesigned movie version called Starship Troopers Prepare for Battle that coincided with the movie's release that year. Notably for Avalon Hill fans, 1977 was known as the Year of the Acquisition. In May of 1976, Avalon Hill had made the strategic decision to purchase the entire line of games created by 3M, also known as the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, who these days are mainly known for their invention of the post-it note. Always known for being innovative, 3M had originally created the bookcase style of packaging for games. And there were a fair number of titles, which included versions of the classics Chess, Go, Backgammon, Challenge Bridge, and Owa Ri, the latter being a variation on the Mancala Pit and Pebble games. It was nice that Avalon Hill was finally able to offer the full range of these classics under their brand name. There were also some sports games added to the lineup, like Challenge Football, which has an interesting system with which to play a football game. The defense chooses one of four basic defense cards while the offensive player draws the path of the running play or pass with a special pencil. The ball stops where the defensive play card is in line with the drawn offensive play. Challenge Golf at Pebble Beach allows players to play that famous golf course in paper and cardboard. Choose your club, read the wind, assess the distance and direction, and roll the dice. 
You can choose a style of golfer from one of four. Old Smoothie, who is steady and reliable. Boomer, who can really drive the ball. Ironsides, who is good with the irons. And Blade, who is a putting machine. Speed Circuit, a Formula One racing game, had been originally published by 3M in 1973, and Don Greenwood did some redesign work, improving it a fair bit, although the 3M version apparently had metal cars which were replaced with plastic ones. The Avalon Hill version added dice when players wanted to take risks, and 15 additional tracks were also made available from the company. The original 3M version also used little speedometer wheels to select speed, and a random card draw to determine a car's characteristics. Win, Place, and Show had been originally published by 3M in 1966 with wraparound plastic map boards, which characterized their entire sports line. Players take the role of not only owner, handicapper, and better, but as a jockey as well. Skill in all these areas will ensure the win with six horses and six different race courses to choose from. There were also some games that were more mature, like Executive Decision, Point of Law, Stocks and Bonds, Venture, and the classic Acquire. Executive Decision is a game by Sid Saxon where every player is a high-level executive, buying raw materials and producing and selling a finished product, trying to make the biggest profit. It's a simple model of an economy, and there are no random elements, so on a certain level it's an interesting game with some interesting mechanics, but don't look for much in the way of theme, and it can be extremely harsh, as an economy can be, I suppose. Point of Law puts the player in the role of judge and jury, which is based on a hundred actual courtroom decisions from the past. Stocks and Bonds is exactly what you would expect, where the gameplay involves buying and selling stocks and bonds to make a profit and outdo the other players. It's not totally unlike a game like Stock Ticker, as there is generally some luck involved, but it is much more sophisticated. Venture is another money-making game by Saxon, but at a large scale where players are tycoons wheeling and dealing and attempting to control and manipulate corporations and create conglomerates. It is more or less a business version of Rummy, easy to learn but without much of a strong theme. Acquire is yet another design by Sid Saxon where players invest in the stock of various hotel chains, which then expand and merge with each other, which creates profits for the players. This game has a really elegant design, arguably a masterpiece. It has a nice balance of luck and strategy. The Collector was originally published under the name High Bid and is an excellent multiplayer auction card game inspired by Gin Rummy, but it never sold well. Players are competing for valuable collections and are attempting to outbid and outbluff each other while concealing their specific strategy. Also, some abstracts and other miscellaneous games came out, like Contigo, which mixed together elements of chess with pit and pebble games like Mancala and programmed moves. It could be a game of alignment for two players or a quick game of capture for four. Twixt is a game where players try to connect their borders with an uninterrupted chain of linked pegs before their opponent can do the same. Apparently it was considered the second best 3M game of all time. Ploy is a game of strategy and maneuver in the space age. Players try to capture their opponent's commander or all of their lances, probes, and shields. The pieces move along paths indicated on them, so players must time not only their move carefully, but also the rotation of their pieces. Feudal is a game set in medieval times, not unlike chess in many ways, as the armies of two kings battle to the death. Terrain and hidden initial deployment add some additional interest to this one. Foil is a word game that involves not only forming words, but unscrambling them against the clock. Image is an interesting game where players have to use their memory and cards to create images that profile famous people or fictional characters. Players have to think of someone that fits all the cards that have been played on an image, or they will lose points if they can't. Sleuth is another Sid Saxon design where players are detectives trying to use their powers of deduction and logic to figure out the identity of a missing gem. This is done by strategically questioning each other and putting together the clues to solve the mystery. Hectics is less of a game and more of a puzzle, where players take the three bits and nine pieces apart and then try to put it back together again. Stack Tac Toe is like three-dimensional Tic Tac Toe, where players still try to get three in a row, but the stacks of pegs can be moved around to scramble things. 
Evade is a game that appears to have been part of this acquisition, although the company's official history doesn't mention it. This was one of 3M's later releases in their gaming venture. It's a simple bluffing game where players have six pawns each on a 6x6 grid. Magnets are placed under two of those pawns to distinguish them from the others, and players must successfully get at least one of their magnetized pawns to the other side of the board. Opposing pawns are not taken but are instead frozen, which creates a bit of terrain to work around. There's also a mention of Marble Maze, which I assume is just that, one of those mazes where you need to use your powers of coordination to steer a marble from start to finish, but there's no real mention of it anywhere, so it can't be confirmed. There seems to be another game mentioned called Frantic, of which there seems to be no record at all. Also, about six months afterward, Avalon Hill acquired the lineup of board games released by Sports Illustrated. The main benefit of this was not only a larger variety of games, but the marketing exposure increased for war games, and it opened the doors to retail outlets that had previously been denied. The Sports Illustrated acquisition was also successful, although the games themselves needed some work to improve them. But combining the Avalon Hill design expertise and the Sports Illustrated brand clout led to a fast-growing and successful sports line of games. The first of these games was Superstar Baseball, where players put together teams out of 96 of the greatest players of all time, as of the 70s anyway. Then one could manage the team, calling plays during the game, and also back office things like trading players and bringing up replacements. Interestingly, special dice are used for determining the results of plays. The potential rolls ranged from 10 to 39. Go for the Green takes 18 of the best holes that could be found to build a dream golf course in cardboard. You have the trees, water hazards, traps, and everything else. Players choose their clubs, line up their shots, then check their distance before they let it fly. While there are dice involved, a ball flight indicator was used to trace the trajectories of the balls onto the laminated maps. Track Meet allows players to compete against each other in all 10 events of the decathlon, making the most of their athletes' unique abilities in either singles or teams to see if they can even break a world record. Injuries and fatigue are factors, as well as deciding whether to play it safe or go for the gold. This game had some issues. For one, there wasn't a lot of important decisions to be made, which made the players more like spectators than active agents. Play balance was also an issue. One of the athletes included in the game was Jim Thorpe, an athlete so dominant in his era that his cardboard representative was almost unbeatable. Add that to the fact that the game boards weren't actually necessary for any event other than the 1500 meter run. It didn't make for a great gaming experience. Paydirt is also a game by Sports Illustrated, but was given a welcome rework by Thomas Nicely and Bruce Milligan. The core of this game were team charts that had been designed based on statistics, providing each team with strengths and weaknesses in different areas. The gameplay is simple, perhaps too simple, and there is a fair bit of luck involved. While the original game hadn't updated the team since 1972, Avalon Hill made the commitment to update the team charts annually available direct from the company. College football is very similar to Paydirt, except it allows you to coach and quarterback the top college teams of the 60s and 70s, with computer-analyzed play action charts to resolve the plays. A man by the name of Bruce Milligan came on board in May of 1977 to head up the sports division and to edit a publication named All-Star Replay, which was dedicated to covering Avalon Hill sports games. A total of 19 issues were published quarterly, later bi-monthly, from 1977 to 1981. In addition to all this, yet another game company was acquired that year. They were called Aladdin Games, which specialized in abstract and educational games. Unfortunately, there was limited sales success and most of their games were discontinued before too long. Let's look at a quick summary of them. First, Bali is a game of building words by utilizing cards in a fashion not unlike Klondike Solitaire. You build down from an initial spread of seven letters, making word fragments that can be moved from column to column by yourself or even stolen by other players. Perplexus is a game of five in a row, only your opponent can shift the play area on you with plastic slide pieces. Triples and deluxe triples with three Ps have an interesting concept. Players must move their see-through piece across a field made up of tiles with three arrows printed on them to get to their home base. 
The catch is that your options for movement are based on the arrows showing on the tile underneath your opponent's piece. Totally is yet another Sid Saxon game, where players have to arrange numbers to arrive at a certain total. When the first player finishes, a three minute timer starts, and the other players have to finish by the time the sand runs dry. Barrier is a game reminiscent of checkers, where players try to jump other pieces from adjacent squares. However, here pieces can not only move diagonally but forward, and there are barrier rows in the center of the board that dictate which direction players can move from there. It wasn't a great game, especially as players could wind up endlessly chasing each other around the board when they only had one or two pieces left. The rules were vague as well. Games were sold immediately from the stock of the original publishers, but in 1977 the games became available with Avalon Hill packaging and with some tweaks provided by the design staff. Not all titles were big names, obviously, so the smaller, less popular games sold until their inventories ran out, but some games did very well. Facts in 5 was one of those games from 3M that climbed to the top of Avalon Hill sales. While it was good for the company, it unfortunately also highlighted the sales limits of war games versus games with more mass appeal. In this game, players draw 5 cards with categories and then 5 letter tiles. Players have 5 minutes to come up with an example that begins with each letter drawn for each category, and points are scored accordingly. It is a fun little game that is a good intellectual challenge. But aside from these acquisitions, Avalon Hill was creating more classic board games, beginning with a game that was, at the time, a little bit out of the box. Rail Baron is another landmark game, and one of the first of a large number of games involving railroads. It was originally published under the name Boxcars, and it even turns up as such in early Avalon Hill advertising. The game takes place in the United States along the routes of 28 historic railroads over seven different regions. Players need to move their train token to different map destinations, collect some cash, and use that money to upgrade their train or purchase a railroad. The first player to accumulate $200,000 and then make a run back to their home city wins the game. It had a lot of luck involved, but it was well regarded. But Avalon Hill's stock and trade, War Games, had another strong year, with three big titles revealed at Origins 3. Arab-Israeli Wars was supposed to be the culmination of the Panzer Blitz system, combining the classic mechanics with contemporary conflict and weaponry in 24 scenarios set in the Middle East between 1967 and 1973. It did make some advances with the game system, like adding morale and a quality rating for the troops for the first time, but it changed the basis of the system which meant that the other two sister games, Panzer Blitz and Panzer Leader, didn't completely mesh with this newest iteration. This, along with the feeling that the Panzer Blitz system was now outdated, led to some frustration by veteran wargamers. The Charles Roberts award-winning Victory in the Pacific, a famously playable Richard Hamblin design, also came out that year. This was a sister game to War at Sea, but it added some more sophistication in the form of carrier warfare, raiding and patrolling ships, and island hopping. It was also interesting in that the Japanese Navy starts out as numerically very strong, but gradually loses that advantage as the American industrial production ramps up, resulting in lots of reinforcements. There is certainly lots of dice rolling in this game, but there is some strategy as well. Interestingly, at the expert level, the Japanese are considered to have the advantage, so it's not unusual for players to bid for that side in competitive play. And then, the crowning achievement of the entire year was the release of Squad Leader. This was a John Hill and Don Greenwood design and won a Charles Roberts Award in 1978. This game was universally acclaimed in the wargaming community, the first big splash since Panzer Blitz with sales to match. The second edition, which came in the following year, provided a new box, enlarged map boards, and revised rules. It uses a method of programmed rules to teach the game, where players learn a set of rules, play a scenario to get them under their belts, and then add more complexity and rules as the game progresses. Even though there was a lot of abstraction and oversimplification, the game really does combine all its various parts into an incredible whole that feels very realistic. It is widely seen as the best Avalon Hill game ever published. The 70s were drawing to a close and what a decade so far. Avalon Hill was churning out classic after classic, and if they didn't make it themselves, they went out and bought the game titles to cover any shortfalls. 
Thank you for watching our ongoing series chronicling the history of the Avalon Hill Game Company. This is Legendary Tactics.